So hello everyone. Um, welcome to our uh, School of Public Policy webinar. Uh, my name is Ken McKenzie. I'm a professor in the Department of Economics and a distinguished fellow, or maybe not so distinguished, at the School of Public Policy uh, at the University of Calgary. And I'd like to thank all of you for joining us here today. Let me just check the last time I looked, we were at um, how many here? I think we were north of 100. Uh, now we're at 133 with a bullet. So um, a good turnout here today. Um, as you all know, uh, the School of Public Policy is a leading policy school in Canada, uh, known for its practical policy-oriented research and for bringing people like you together uh, to discuss important issues with experts, uh, which is what we're here to do today. Um, I'll just tell you that if you have to leave early, um, we post recordings of all of our webinars uh, on our website uh, and YouTube channel, and we'll send you a link um, in a follow-up email uh, to tell you how to access that recording. Uh, the topic for today's webinar is economic diversification, model, myth, or mischief. And I invite you to say that five times really quickly. Uh, I think the idea of economic diversification, how to measure it, uh, and the role that governments should or should not play in encouraging it has long been discussed uh, in Alberta uh, and elsewhere. Uh, and I, said, I think in particular, as we emerge from uh, the pande pandemic lockdown, and begin to contemplate structural changes uh, in the economy, and no doubt there will be significant ones, and begin to grope our way towards some notion of the new normal, I think this issue is looming all the larger. Um, so I think it's, it's quite topical uh, in terms of emerging from where we're currently at. Now, our speaker today is uh, Dr. Trevor Toome. And Trevor's an associate professor of economics at the University of Calgary and a research fellow uh, at uh, the uh, SBP. I'm sure you're all very familiar with Trevor. Uh, he's well known for his very careful and insightful, and I would say principled data-driven approach to analyzing various public policy issues. And I'd also add that from a personal perspective, he's a very, value, uh, very valued colleague uh, and is indeed my go-to person if I wanna have a spirited discussion uh, on almost any topic. Uh, we can usually find, if I'm late for class, it's usually because I'm uh, in Trevor's office arguing with him about something. Uh, the format today is really simple. Trevor's going to take about 10 minutes to give a briefing uh, on the issue, sort of summarize it, and then we'll open it up for an audience uh, Q&A. And what I'd uh, in encourage you to do that as the uh, seminar proceeds, please type your questions by clicking uh, on the Q&A box you'll see at the bottom of your screen. And then after Trevor's presentation, I'll distill and, uh, those questions and then pose them to Trevor at the end. So I'll now turn things over to Trevor uh, and um, enjoy. Great. Thank you, Ken. That's great. And thank you all for being here today. And of course, as Ken mentioned, we're here to talk about economic diversification in Alberta specifically and where we go from here. Of course, it's not a new topic. We've been discussing issues around diversification in Alberta literally for decades. Uh, and in recent years, we hear about this issue more and more during periods of economic downturns. And the thinking is that if we just attract businesses other than extractive resources, then Alberta will be on a more stable economic footing and we'll have uh, smaller ups and downs, if you will. And so what I want to do today is unpack that very complex issue with uh, a high level perspective using some theory and some data. And that's what I'm going to start with uh, today. So for the first 10 or 15 minutes or so, give that perspective. Uh, I'll note that a lot of what I'm going to share today is building off of a recently published or not so recently now published paper that I co-authored with a colleague of mine, Professor Robert Mansell at the School of Public Policy. And that's entitled, If It Matters, Measure It, Unpacking Diversification in Canada. And so that's available on the school's website, policyschool.ca. Now it was published in 2016, so much of what I'm gonna show you today is updating uh, some of the results in, in that paper. So before I begin to dive into the data, I do wanna take a moment to recognize again that Alberta has been talking about this issue for 
a very long time. So here's the Calgary Herald in the 1930s, where the Commissioner for Livestock of the province of Alberta, noting that greater diversification in Alberta will hasten prosperity's return, as though getting out of the Great Depression requires that we diversify the economy. And at the time, what he was really referring to is the need for more cattle and less grain. Uh, and that's historically how we have talked about diversification. Another Herald article in 1905 in September, very immediately after the province was formed, uh, noting that uh, diversification will prove the farmer's redemption, right? If you just diversify your crops then things will be stable and you will have uh, prosperity. Now, more recently, of course, we don't think about it in terms of agriculture. We think about it in terms of oil and gas. And that started largely under the premiership of Peter Lougheed. Uh, he attempted uh, many, you know, a wide variety of initiatives to increase uh, what he considered diversification in the province, proved very difficult. Here's a Herald article in 83, noting that it has remained elusive for him. Now, he did that in a period of high oil prices. And after the mid-1980s, uh, we tend to focus on the issue of diversification more in period of low prices, uh, in particular here in 1987. So this is right after the very sharp drop in oil prices in 1986. Even the federal government gets into the diversification game with big aid programs for the West, creating at the time and what remains with us today, Western economic diversification. So billions are allocated in pursuit of this objective of diversification. And so we should ask uh, whether it's warranted, what the trade-offs are and uh, how we can think about measuring diversification in the province now and how it compares to our own selves in the past and other jurisdictions in Canada and around the world. So I'm not just sharing kind of anecdotally here a couple uh, selected articles. If you go through and look at all of the Calgary Herald articles referencing diversification since the early 1970s, you see quite clearly that during the era of Peter Lougheed, years in which oil prices were high, the amount of attention given to diversification was higher than in years when oil prices were low. So it, during his premiership, it was very much an issue that was a focus even during periods of high oil prices. But that all changed over the past 40 years or so. So on the right, we see a very strong negative correlation between oil prices and Herald references to diversification. That's not just a Don Getty thing. So it's not dominated by low prices in the 80s, even dropping his uh, premierships. We see this strong negative correlation between the two. So what I want to focus on is really this more recent period here, not uh, so these years here, not the early years under Peter Lougheed, but I would reference uh, a fabulous article also available through the School of Public Policy by uh, Sarah Hastings Simon on industrial policy in Alberta during those early years. So it's really a phenomenal paper that is not just really strong in terms of its coverage of the historical issues at the time, but makes a lot of connections to issues today. So I highly recommend that paper for discussion of those years. So instead, uh, what I want to do in this webinar is kind of briefly go through measuring diversification. I'll focus on employment and income GDP uh, measurements. I want to talk also about economic volatility, give us a sense of it precisely how volatile Alberta is relative to others, and then end on just a very brief um, uh, discussion of the policy options and the trade-offs involved. And hopefully that provides a nice springboard for the Q&A to come. So measuring diversification. So what do we mean by that? Typically we think about how concentrated employment or economic activity is in different sectors. So I'm going to start just by providing you a sense of exactly what are the sectors that employ the most number of Albertans and how that compares to other jurisdictions. So in this table here, we see the rank of the largest employers. So at the top is health and social um, services. This sector employs more individuals than any other sector, so it is ranked number one in Canada. It is also the number one ranked sector for employment in BC, Alberta, Ontario, Quebec. So it's basically the number one sector 
everywhere, Alberta included. So most economic activity uh, in terms of employment is dominated by that sector. Below that, number two is retail. They're also the second most important in Alberta, Ontario, and Quebec, although they're the third most important in, in British Columbia. Education, number three, accommodation, food services, number four. So you can see that the top sectors in Alberta in terms of employment are very similar to the top sectors in terms of employment in other provinces. So we, like elsewhere, are a services dominated economy. Uh, of course, there are uh, exceptions there. If we look down Alberta, the number eight sector in terms of employment, so the eighth most important employer and just in terms of headcounts is oil and gas. Uh, that compares very similarly to Ontario where employment dominated there by uh, finance at, at ranked number seven. So here this gives you a sense of where the jobs are by sector. And we do tend to focus a lot on the importance of oil and gas, but it is not the number one sector. Uh, it is the number eight sector. And in the paper, I'm not going to go through it today, but we even account for employment that is indirect. So the accountant whose clients are predominantly oil and gas firms, for example. So you can do an adjustment to the distribution of employment, even looking at those indirect jobs. So Alberta, just glancing at this table, it doesn't seem as though it's overly concentrated relative to other jurisdictions in terms of uh, oil and gas. In GDP terms, this is roughly speaking the overall level of income that is generated in the province. So here it's asking what is the largest sector in terms of its contribution to overall economic activity in dollars, in terms of GDP. So each bar represents here the share of GDP accounted for by the number one sector in each province. So we have Alberta, 15%, about 16, 17% or so is accounted for by oil and gas. The energy sector more broadly, including petrochemicals, things like that is about 20% of GDP in Alberta. If we look to our neighbors to the West in British Columbia, we see that real estate is a sector that accounts for basically the same amount of GDP. In fact, slightly more there than oil and gas does here. Now you can see across all the provinces with the exception of Newfoundland, the top sector typically accounts for 10 to 15% of overall economic activity. In five of those provinces, it is real estate. In uh, three, Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Newfoundland, not surprisingly, it's, it's oil and gas. But you can see Newfoundland and the territories really stand out in terms of how large their number one sector although, is although even in those cases, it's between 20 and, and 25%. So this gives you just a very high level rough summary, a more sophisticated way to summarize the full distribution of employment and a real measure of diversification is uh, what's called the Herfindahl index. So this is a common index of concentration and diversification uh, that I'm gonna show you for employment and, and GDP. Here it basically asks the question, what's the probability that if you randomly pick up two Albertans that they will be working in the same sector? So the more concentrated employment is in a, a small number of sectors, the higher the probability is that you will be drawing individuals who work in the same sector. So the lower the Herfindahl index, the higher the level of diversification, if you will. So in terms of employment in Alberta, our Herfindahl index is actually lower than any other jurisdiction and has been lower for the better part of a half century, as we can see here in, in this graph. So the, the overall diversification in terms of the distribution of employment in Alberta is actually quite high. Now, of course, this is, again, just direct employment. You can do an adjustment to this to account for indirect jobs. Uh, but in, when you do that, Alberta becomes middle of the pack with basically the same Herfindahl index of overall employment as what you see in Ontario and Quebec, even accounting for uh, those indirect jobs. In terms of GDP, what does our level of diversification look like there? Well, it's slightly different story there. So we have a higher level of GDP concentration than BC, Ontario, or Quebec, not the highest in the country. So in 2018 here, we see an ever so slightly higher level of diversification in Alberta in terms of 
GDP. I'm sorry, high index here means high concentration, so low GDP uh, diversification. Over time, though, there's a lot of variation in that measure uh, in terms of GDP diversification. This is very different than what we saw for employment. So here on the right, we see a graph plotting that Herfindahl index over time. So you can see that in gray, Newfoundland, when offshore oil and gas began to grow very large, their Herfindahl index increased dramatically, showing much higher levels of economic concentration there. In blue, you see Alberta also rising at that time. Now, this is a period of high uh, oil prices in general uh, leading up to the financial crisis. And so we did display in periods of high oil prices, much higher levels of uh, economic concentration in oil and gas. You can also see prior to the 1986 crash that Alberta also had a very high Herf Herfindahl index, so a high level of concentration, which means low level of diversification. So today, um, we're very much in line, not overly uh, different than other sectors. And that, of course, is because oil prices are are low, right? So in 1984, oil and gas was 38% of GDP. Um, by 1986, it was 24%. And that big drop is really just driven by oil prices. And today, oil and gas, as we saw earlier, about 17%. So changes in GDP concentration over time are really driven by events rather than policy, re really driven by commodity price movements. Now, volatility, I just want to briefly talk about uh, this, this is what I think people actually care about when they talk about diversification. We don't have public policy conversations in general um, about diversification and then, and then proceed to talk uh, about Herfindahl indices. We, we bring up the issue of diversification, I think, as a proxy for volatility. And we certainly do that during recessions because the thought is, had we been involved in other sectors, the recession would have been not as deep as it was. So I want to take a moment to talk about volatility in Alberta and how it compares to elsewhere. So one measure of volatility, you can just look at how much does GDP growth jump around from one year to the next uh, in each province. You can look at the standard deviation of overall GDP growth. And in Alberta, you see that the overall standard deviation of GDP, it is higher than it is in British Columbia and Ontario and Quebec. It's not the highest in the country, but it is the second highest. So we do tend to have higher levels of uh, employment volatility. Sorry, I was saying GDP. This is employment volatility in Alberta than elsewhere. A lot of that is, of course, due to volatility in employment in resources and construction. Abstracting from those two sectors alone, we see that employment volatility in Alberta overall is basically the same as what we see in British Columbia. So overall, you know, there is an elevated level of employment volatility in Alberta compared to elsewhere, and it is due to volatility in these two sectors that are tied heavily, of course, to oil and gas activity. But overall, it's not the case that we have overly pronounced business cycles. And I just want to illustrate that graphically here. So since 1980, these are all the recessions that provinces have experienced in the country. So this is plotting out by how much employment falls during each recession by province. Alberta in red here, 2015-16, what was potentially a second recession, although the, you know, the jury is still out on that starting in 2018, uh, we saw employment drop about 3% at peak in that past recession. Over all of our past recessions since 1980, we saw that the worst one there, which was uh, in the early 80s, we saw a recession where employment dropped more than 6%. Compared to BC, that's actually very similar. So the overall depth of business cycles and the overall length of them in Alberta in terms of employment is very similar here compared to elsewhere. Similar to Ontario, they even act actually had a much worse one there in the 1990s. Quebec tends to have uh, less severe employment downturns during their recessions. But overall, Alberta recessions are very much like what you see elsewhere. In terms of income volatility, though, it's very different. We have very high levels of income or nominal GDP growth uh, from one year to the next. They're jumping around on average that growth rate uh, by 8% a year. So we have very high volatility in nominal GDP. Now, a lot of that is, of course, due to commodity price movements, which translates into corporate profits uh, or operating surplus in the national account data. So a big chunk, a majority, 
of the excess volatility that you see in Alberta's economy overall is really due to corporate profits. And, and that, is, that is a diversification challenge, but maybe not one for uh, policymakers. It's a diversification challenge that individual investors, for example, can overcome by ensuring their portfolios are um, uh, well diversified and that they're not putting all of their retirement funds into one sector. Uh, but I guess I'll note that income volatility is very clearly higher in Alberta than elsewhere. And I'll end just the final minute here. I know I'm kind of bumping up against my time. Limit is policy options. So you can think broadly, how do you promote diversification? Well, there are top-down options where you can subsidize or provide tax breaks to sectors that you would like to grow. This is typically how Alberta approaches diversification. The prior government, for example, a few years ago, introducing subsidies for petrochemical facilities uh, to the tune of $500 million, for example. Uh, or you could tax or introduce regulatory costs in sectors that you would like to shrink, you know, measures that would maybe suppress the growth in oil and gas, um, for example, or you could do marketing campaigns to try and attract businesses in other sectors. Amazon HQ2 efforts were, I guess, the most prominent example of that. Or you could appro approach diversification in terms of bottom-up initiatives where you provide insurance to kind of buffer uh, the ups and downs uh, in terms of the income shocks to workers and potentially businesses as well, improve the business environment just to try and in attract investment, but be completely agnostic about which sector that investment uh, flow occurs uh, into. Or you could try and create new sources of comparative advantage where you're not subsidizing particular businesses, but you're trying to change the underlying endowments in the economy through, say, education, for example, that might attract uh, businesses. So I'll end by noting an important trade-off here in terms of the top-down um, policies to shift economic activity away from some sectors and towards others. You may lower volatility, but that can often come at the cost of lowering productivity. And of course, there is a real opportunity cost of public funds as well, leading uh, these kind of initiatives to either lower program spending elsewhere or potentially lead to higher taxes. So with, with all that in mind, the very high level data summary, I think now is a good time to uh, turn uh, to the, the Q&A. So I will pitch it back to, to Ken. Okay, Trevor, thank you very much. That was, that was a great, I think, overview. Um, you know, I'm now noticing that we peaked out at 223 participants. So I mean, it doesn't get any better than this, hanging out with 223 of your best friends talking about diversification. So I think this is what these uh, webinars are all about. We have lots of questions and unfortunately, uh, you're gonna have to filter, you are filtering them through me, so I get to put my own spin on them. Um, and I apologize if I don't completely represent your, uh, your question very well. But actually, a very, one of the very first ones we got was uh, was along the lines uh, along the following lines, and it actually is a question that I have as well. So the very term diversification kind of tends to carry some baggage with it, especially in an Alberta context. You presented some some uh, some graphics to that regard, uh, and it, it it's historically meant moving away from fossil fuel development. So you know the, the question is uh, why saddle us with this history instead of just promoting business development. And let me just spin that a little bit my way. Um, and that is, can you, what do you think uh, in an Alberta context or even generally the impediments, uh, what impediments exist to sort of structural changes and, re, and, and, and realignment in the economy um, um, as it currently stands uh, or even more generally? So I guess I, I would maybe answer that differently by saying it, it's important for us to define the problem that we are trying to solve. And I think when we just jump into how do we diversify, we're not properly defining the objective we have in mind for the policies that we want to talk about. So it, at least the high level data that I provided here suggests that there's not really a diversification problem in terms of jobs or real economic activity, but there may be a diversification challenge in terms of where our income comes from. And our income is more volatile in Alberta than elsewhere. Whether that leads one to then think about ways of shifting economic activity to less volatile sector uh, sectors is not a conclusion I would jump to right away. A lot of the income volatility, as I noted, is in the form of corporate profits, and that's for 
individual investors to diversify themselves. Um, we're exposed to income risk as individuals and workers, and we can think about policies that provide insurance support, if you will, things like EI or, or uh, expanded versions of that, for example. And then another source of income volatility that we feel is through the government budget, uh, because it relies so heavily on royalties from oil and gas. And, and that's, I think, the real low-hanging fruit in terms of the diversification challenge in the province of Alberta. It's not structurally shifting the economy, it's fixing the budget. And these are two entirely different issues. And often policymakers will conflate the two. They'll point to the resource royalty roller coaster and then roll out a policy to try and shift economic activity, when really it's just a question of uh, deciding where we get our revenue from. Uh, so I think we, we need to first, as a province, properly understand what the problem is that we want to solve. And if it's income volatility, it often doesn't lead to many of the policies that we see in Alberta, which are really often top-down subsidies or tax breaks to certain selected firms uh, or sectors. Great. Thanks, Trevor. Uh, I forgot to mention that we have decided to uh, stretch things out a bit. Um, um, at this point, our plan is to go to 1245 because we do have lots of questions. Uh, right, I'll, I'll stick around. We won't be able to get to all of them, but we'll, we'll do our best. I have to get to this one though, um, and I've sort of skipped over a few, so I apologize. Um, as we know, the provincial government has recently invested in the Keystone Pipeline um, um, being built by TC Energy. And uh, you know, the general question is, uh, Good idea. <laughs> Secondly, um, um, uh, do you think there's scope for governments, uh, the provincial government, or maybe even more generally governments investing at a particular at this at this particular time, uh, which is unprecedented, uh, to encourage diversification in the private sector? So uh, I guess let me provide two answers. First, generically, pipelines are of great value to the province in the sense that it's the constraint on our ability to export oil and gas that can lead to higher differentials between the price that our producers receive here for their oil and gas relative to world market prices elsewhere. And pipelines in general being the lower cost means of shipping oil out, those are transportation infrastructure that can shrink that differential. That has a direct effect, of course, on the industry as a whole, uh, producing about 1.3 billion barrels per year in Alberta means that each dollar change in that differential is big revenue changes to that sector. But there's also implications for royalty revenues for the provincial government as well. So these kind of projects help maximize the value of the oil and gas that we have in the province. And we as Albertans are owners of that resource. And so I think generically and in general, that's the case for pipelines. Now, what's the case for government intervention with pipelines? Well, as we saw with Trans Mountain, uh, the level of regulatory and political risk can be high for these projects. And rightly so. They're complex projects that touch on lots of difficult issues. And so they're unavoidably going to be running up against these kind of challenges um, through the regulatory and approval process and so on. And so with Trans Mountain, those risks were too high for the private proponent and the government needed to step in. Now, in that case, it's a pipeline within Canada. And so government involvement there de-risks it in the sense that it turns what is a regulatory risk into a choice that the government makes. Now it's the owner, it can kind of choose um, the choose to overcome if it wishes the, the hurdles that may be a private uh, proponent cannot. In, in Keystone's case, government involvement there, by Canadian government at least, doesn't de-risk it in the same sense because the risk here, as we've seen recently, is U.S. political risk federally. Um, it, it really hinges potentially on the outcome of the presidential campaign, although who really knows? Biden can say that he'll cancel it, whether he'll follow through or not is a completely different different question, but the Alberta government financial investment in that project definitely doesn't de-risk it in the same way that the federal investment in Trans Mountain did. Um, so there's, there's some real risks there. Whether Trans Canada would have pulled out of Keystone were it not for the Alberta government financial investment, that's an interesting question, and I don't know. Yeah, I don't think anybody does. Um, I'm sort of glomming quite a few of the questions together because some of them are similar, but I'm going to sort of filter this one through uh, 
of, of diversification. I mean, what is the nature of the sort of underlying sort of market failure there that uh, that we don't think? You know, I mean, you talked about political risk, but let's actually put that aside because I'm not mm -hmm. sure Alberta government ownership has a lot to say on that for Keystone. But nonetheless, what's the sort of fundamental nature of that market failure? And I have a follow on to that, but I'll let you get sure. to that. So, uh, with respect to pipeline, sorry you froze. So I just want to confirm that the market failure for the government intervention in pipelines in general. Yeah. Yeah. So the way I think about this is very similar to how I think about traffic congestions. Uh, there's an externality from each driver going on the road in that it can delay the, the trip for someone else that they're not accounting for into their decision. So congestion is the result of these negative externalities from individual drivers going on the road. And this can motivate intervention to improve uh, traffic flow through things like um, time of use pricing or congestion pricing, if you will, that some cities are experimenting with. And I think of pipelines in a similar way. There's a fixed capacity for export and each individual shipper may be imposing a negative externality on others in terms of that differential. And so there's a case for public uh, policy to intervene to alleviate what might be that negative congestion externality. I guess the second case, which is unique to Alberta's situation, is that as the owner of the resource itself, uh, actions that increase the value of each barrel that is produced is itself just something that's in the interests of Albertans just because we are the owner of that resource. Thanks, Trevor. We have several questions that are sort of in the following uh, flavor. Um, in terms of what can we learn from other jurisdictions in terms of how they're dealing with this? More generally, um, do we, uh, you know, it, what is the research, what does the literature tell us about whether, uh, I'll call it industrial policy, that's a bit old, of an old school uh, description, versus just creating a good business environment um, in terms of those, those sorts of a different approaches? Right, so, so I tend to look at the, I guess, the overall experience of many jurisdictions here is favoring policies that are neutral, policies that don't themselves pick which firm or which sector or which location economic activity should take place in. So increasing um, the quality of the business environment, ensuring regulations are effective, but also not overly burdensome, ensuring that taxes are, are neutral and efficient uh, is very important to increase economic activity and investment and productivity in a region. Uh, other policies, though, that I think um, many jurisdictions have done, there's actually a CBC article this morning highlighting the experience in New York, for example, where it provided a lot of focus on education, graduate education, high tech uh, training programs, things of this nature, where it's not picking winners and losers in terms of specific businesses, but it's changing the underlying endowments of the economy itself, increasing the supply of high skilled individuals can itself attract firms to that location that use intensively high skilled individuals in their employment. And I think that's a better way to go than governments picking which activity specifically uh, should be pursued and then subsidizing it. You know, direct intervention to specific businesses. In Alberta's case, we often see subsidies to petrochemical facilities. And that, I think, is a policy that can lower overall productivity because the market's telling you that workers are more valuable in other sectors. Petrochemical, to the extent that it's not competitive here because of high wages and high capital costs, that's telling you that those resources are worth uh, more elsewhere. And so subsidizing them shifts resources away from those higher valued alternative uses. And that's the real risk, I think. So policies that are, are neutral, policies that um, try to just create an environment that allows innovation to occur for risks to take place, that again might mean policies that buffer your, your income effectively uh, through things like EI. You know, those are programs that are potentially more more effective. But I'll note that they may not result in diversification. And this is a, a long standing insight in economics all the way back to Adam Smith that you can see economic productivity growth when you specialize in areas where you have a comparative advantage. And so that means that in some sense, there is that fundamental trade off between diversification and aggregate productivity. Um, specializing in what you're good at is not necessarily a bad thing. 
Yeah, and we did have a few questions about the nature of Alberta's comparative advantage, and I think you just addressed that. Mm -hmm. um, but here's sort of another issue in terms of uh, in terms of the policy debate. I mean, you know, not to oversimplify, but there, you know, you, one could think of Alberta as sort of a big mining town, <laughs> and uh, you know, uh, if we are. Uh, relatively reliant. I mean, not the number one sector I get. Oil and gas is, uh, is, is down the list. And I think that in and of itself is an important point to point in out. In terms of employment, <laughs> yeah, but in terms of income that it generates. It's it's higher. Yeah, exactly. And certainly in terms of revenues, which you also adjusted. So if we accept the fact that this is a sector that may be in in, be in sort of in long-term secular decline. And I don't want to get into the issue as to, you know, how long this may take, but there are certainly structural changes in the world, and we're going through one of them right now, perhaps, that are pointing in the direction of a secular decline in that sector. Is there anything on the government side that you think we should be doing to sort of pave the road for a, an easier transition to whatever we may end up with? So there, there's certainly a role for government to support workers through these structural adjustments. And I think this is an issue for Alberta and resources in the same way that it's, it was and still is an issue for quite some time now for Ontario in, in that manufacturing has been shrinking quite dramatically and, and permanently potentially as a result of technological change, automation and, and globalization and imports from China in particular. And workers in particular, those that are maybe older and less able to shift into other activities, that's a really difficult adjustment. And there's a big role, I think, on equity grounds for governments to support individuals displaced from sectors that are, that are, that are shrinking, such as manufacturing. And in Alberta's case, it's not different conceptually to me that we might also want to support workers who are over time displaced from that sector, especially in in smaller towns, for example. You know, we still see that right now with coal phase outs really affecting employment opportunities in, in smaller communities in, in certain parts of Alberta, which is not to say we shouldn't phase out coal um, or accept the reality that over time, especially over like a decade long, a multi-decade long horizon that the demand for oil and gas globally is probably gonna fall. Uh, putting climate aside just for technological change reason alone, uh, we want to think about supporting workers, which is very different than policies to shift economic activity, subsidizing um, different firms or different sectors. And then second, I think that, again, the lowest hanging fruit for the province is not the economy. I think overall, our economy behaves very similarly to economies elsewhere that are not reliant on, on oil and gas, as I, I showed in terms of just employment volatility and the depth and length of recessions here being not all that different from what you see elsewhere. So what the provincial government should do is focus on what is our unique problem, and that's a reliance on royalty revenues to fund public services. You know, we, we, we should pay our way. I, I guess that's a normative statement, so let me back <laughs> away from- It's from okay, you can that, make normative statements. Yeah, I think we, sh yeah, if we <laughs> want to have public services at a certain level, then we all ought to also have a conversation around having taxes to fund those public services. Uh, relying on royalties, which are incredibly volatile, uh, means that we accumulate significant debt during periods of downturn, and we don't tend to, for various political reasons, uh, repay that debt to the same, uh, to the scale that we should when oil prices do rise. We tend to either lower taxes or increase spending. Um, so getting away from our reliance on royalties, saving those revenues, that's the big diversification challenge that I think we should tackle First. Well, you're preaching to the choir here, dude. Um, <laughs> so uh, let me just follow up on, on, on something. I'll just mention this, is that Larry Summers within the context of the US uh, um, response, and you sort of alluded to this a little bit, and I think I, I really want to emphasize, emphasize this for everybody here, says that a lot of the reaction in terms of the, you know, the, the pandemic and the government policies that are in that regard, he, he argues that they shouldn't be based upon trying to keep people employed so much as just giving people relief, right, in some way, shape, or form. So one might argue that the federal wage subsidy, for example, doesn't actually tick the box here. I think it's clear that some sectors are going to decline and we can we can tick off some of them you know air travel hospitality etc we need those sectors to adjust and we don't want the government to provide impediments to that sectoral or secular or structural adjustment 
<laughs> rather we want to support the people that work there directly uh you know uh, so this isn't really a question it's just a gratuitous comment on my part no i do and, have a question and a good no? comment i guess in that and one that is not just something that we're tackling right now i mean the right. pace of change in the current shock is is incredible but yeah. technological change trade flows globalization is always leading some sectors to shrink and others to grow and government has a role to facilitate that adjustment yeah. and it can do it through skills training programs and and so on but then just on on pure equity grounds policies to support individuals as individuals rather than workers or sectors and businesses there yeah i think that makes a lot of sense um we do have a question here in in terms of you presented some data comparing alberta to other provinces uh, but alberta is a little bit different although you, we, newfoundland also is is up there in that we are a quote unquote resource dependent, although I think you document that maybe not as resource dependent as some may think. Um, um, is there evidence from other resource rich economies uh, that are in terms of their diversification, any metrics there that you're familiar with? Yeah, so we could, we can look nationally and compare ourselves with other jurisdictions. Um, and we could do that in a number of ways. So let me show you one chart here. This is again, the Herfindahl index was just that measure of concentration. This is a bit dated here, but it won't change um, too much since then. But here you see Canada in red. Now remember a low Herfindahl index means that you have uh, a low level of concentration. So a high level of diversification. So in terms of Canada as a whole, our nominal GDP diversification is actually higher than most other OECD countries uh, around the world. So what's a, um, a resource? To, well, I mean, you can see the US is about here. I'm trying to look for Norway, but I can't quite see it. Anyway, uh, employment concentrations, the Herfindahl index of the distribution of employment here in this graph, you also see that Canada has a, a lower degree of concentration than other countries around the world. So the, ex the extent to which Alberta's Herfindahl is very similar to other provinces means that Alberta's Herfindahl in employment is lower than most other OECD countries. Uh, where we sit in terms of GDP concentration, we are quite a bit higher than, or not quite a bit, but when oil prices are high, we're quite a bit higher than Canada as a whole. So that would probably put us around here closer to Australia or something, just as some context. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think you're right that that you, it's federalism, right? I mean, so we're a province in a federation that is relatively diverse and other countries, which may be resource dependent, it's the entire country. But as you said, we do compare reasonably well with the rest of Canada. So even using Canada as a proxy seems to work. I have a question here about um, innovation and R&D policies, which is certainly an issue uh, um, that the current government was uh, addressing and made some changes in that regard. Um, and so it's just a general question about the role for those sorts of policies in terms of the, through the diversification lens. Yeah, that, that's a great point. I guess goes to policies that can change the underlying economic endowments that an, an economy has and policies that are neutral with respect to particular sectors or firms. And innovation carries with it you know, lots of cases for government support. One is notable one is that innovation and ideas do have public good components to them and positive externality is associated with it. If I come up with a good idea, uh, then you can use it too. So ideas are Economists say non-rival and non-excludable, which means they're the benefits uh, for society as a whole are larger than the benefits to the specific individual who develops those ideas. Now, policy is to best promote innovation. I will turn to experts such as yourself. So maybe, maybe you actually want to comment on how you think policymakers should, because uh, I think we both agree that there is a role for policy to um, increase the level of R&D and innovation beyond what just a purely private market would would see. But so what are probably some uh, best practices there for policymakers? Oh, good one, Trevor. Just turn it around. I love the pivot. We did get a request to have a debate between you and I on some issues. So maybe this can be the start of that. We'll have to find something we disagree on first. <laughs> I think we might agree on this one. I don't want to spend, you know, I, I won't go a lot into a lot of detail, but I do think that there's good, strong arguments that we should be certainly looking at support for R&D in the subsidy uh, level. We have a pretty generous support at the federal level in Canada, 
Um, um, and there's a, quite a bit of variation amongst the provinces. Alberta just recently changed their policy on that by eliminating the RMD tax credit. Um, you know, if I'm to be frank, I'm not so sure that was a very good idea. Uh, there are issues here in terms of the taxability of corporations, especially now. Uh, almost anything we do on the corporate tax front probably isn't going to have a lot, a huge impact because there's going to be companies that aren't going to be paying taxes for many years now because they're in a loss situation. So we might want to think about refundability. Um, mm. You know, certainly some federal panels have looked at that. So I think it's a good uh, a really good issue. Let me just, you know, pivot, uh, and, and I think this will be our, our final question here because we're running out of time, we've gone over time. But I think, that, you know, let's pivot back to the pandemic. And this is the whole idea that there's a big discussion now about uh, global supply chains and, uh, and this idea that we need to buy local, we need, we need more self-sufficiency in terms of providing particular goods. And we are obviously very focused on PPE in that regard but even other things. And so, you know, again, within the context of the current environment, um, is there some scope for government to promote diversification, quote unquote, within that context? So that's a, that's a tough one. It's certainly one that's very salient now. If you look around the world, 94 countries, um, as of yesterday, have export restrictions or bans in place for a wide variety of medical device and equipment products, PPE, but also food products. You're seeing during the pandemics, countries around the world, the United States included, almost all European countries, uh, have these policies that restrict trade in these goods. And because of the, the lag in terms of our ability to produce them, but the very you know tight timelines where we need them on the demand side in the healthcare system i think there there may be a case to have if not domestic production capacity for these uh, medical related items then just larger stockpiles and that's another way in which you can um cushion yourself when demand spikes for these products, PPE and devices and, and so on, by having stockpiles to buy time to, when necessary, increase domestic production capacity. So, you know, I may concede um, the, the value of having domestic production capability in certain critical items, but broadly speaking, no. And I think that's where I think there's a real risk here, where this is an event that in the US in particular, which for years now has been trying to shrink uh, supply chains and bring production back to the United States, this can have implications for productivity globally. Half of global trade crosses more than one border. So two or more borders, which is I, I make a part, ship it to you, you assemble it into another part and ship it to yet a third country for either consumption there or final assembly to be shipped for a fourth country. So supply chains are long, and that's because firms are taking advantage of comparative advantage. They're supplying from those who are more productive, therefore a higher quality or lower price. And if we have policies that inhibit that, then it will mean lower economic growth potentially in the future and certainly a lower level of productivity. So I think that's a real risk that we should push against, certainly as a country like Canada, where so much economic activity depends on global trade. So ensuring that we continue to support and push forward on um, what the government likes to say, rules-based international you know, order, I think that's absolutely in Canada's interest. So I do worry about the direction of certain of the United States uh, under either party. I think there's protectionist sentiment that's growing and it's broadly held there. So I do, I do worry about that. Um, yeah. Even though one I might- would, I would just add also and uh, that, you know, in, there's a sense in which it's a business decision. I mean, if the, you know, and, and again, where's the market failure? So if the risk premium on have on sole sourcing something from China or somewhere else has gone up, uh, then businesses will make the decision that maybe we don't want to do quite as much of that simply because the risk premium, so to speak, has gone up. And that's not really a role for government to play, except for in, I think, the public health area and the, and the, and the important equipment. So I agree with that. 
Well, I'm pretty sure that Ashley is chomping at her teeth right now. We've now gone 20 minutes over time. Uh, uh, we still have so many questions to, uh, to, uh, to answer, but unfortunately we can't get to them. And we're still holding at 165 participants. So we've held their, their attention uh, up till this point. I think we could talk about these issues for a long time. And I think it's a testament uh, to, uh, to Trevor's expertise in this area uh, and his wide knowledge on a lot of issues. You heard him talk about trade, which is, is really where his, uh, you know, I think he cut his teeth. Uh, all of this is connected and I think it's a, a testament to your uh, thoughtfulness uh, and insights in these areas that we had so many people here today. So I, I'll thank you again, Trevor, for a really great presentation. I want to thank everybody for, uh, for uh, coming today uh, virtually. Um, and uh, we will um, uh, ask you to keep your eye on our webinars going forward uh, under the events page at the School of Public Policy. And as I indicated, we will send out an email with the recording of this uh, if you want to revisit these very insightful comments once again. So let's all virtually thank Trevor and uh, uh, thank you all for coming. Thank you, Ken.